Hello, party people, and welcome to Diamond Beach. It's uh, right next to Jokasarlan Lagoon in Iceland. It's off the south coast of Iceland. Black sand beach, but one of the things that's most interesting about it is it's right next to an inlet where iceberg pieces wash off from a glacier. The iceberg pieces come off from this glacier down this river whenever the tide goes out. They come out into the ocean here, and then you can just go pick them up. So uh, you can go pick up pieces of glaciers if you want to go uh, uh, get your hands on one. And uh, then also you can go sit on them too. Uh, it'll be a beautiful thing to see as I go through and do questions for y'all because the sea will continuously move these little glaciers around. Let me reset this in so I can get that in. There we go. Uh, so it's just a neat thing to go see, uh, and it changes all the time depending on the tide and the sunlight, uh, how, uh, how big the glacier pieces are, just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so let's get to some of y'all's questions about uh, SQL Server. Let's see here. Oh, I probably got a pull. I don't think these are touch sensitive. Oh, they are. Good. So Null Pointer says, we're looking at moving our at to Azure SQL database to make it easier for us to scale out and allow us to get out of the data center business. Some people in our organization worry about all our data being in Azure with no external backup. What are your thoughts? You know, especially in the day and age of ransomware, where so many people didn't really have a good plan B for their backups, where they had their backups in the same places that were accessible via uh, any NT security, Active Directory security, and somebody caught one Active Directory uh, admin login and then they hose everything with ransomware. I don't know that it really matters as much that all your eggs are in one data center company basket, like whether it's Azure, or Amazon, or Google. I'm less worried about that, and I'm more worried about the basic security practices that you take. Azure is less of a concern for me than just your organization's own security. Having said that, what you can do, and what we do actually at Brenos R Unlimited, is do backups to other cloud providers we're not at the point, for example, SQL Constant Care relies on so much that's built into to, uh, Amazon Web Services. It's not like we're at the point where we could immediately light up our entire infrastructure on another provider. We're Amazon primary. We have our backup, a set of backups over in Azure at all times. It's not like we could immediately light up all of our applications over in Azure, but at least you have a separate set of backups over there. See, if your organization was paranoid enough, you could take those same approaches. It's just expensive, especially when you consider often your data center automation, your application deployments, all usually have scripts that are specific to one specific cloud provider, and you can't just forklift those over to another one. So it just depends on how much risk you're willing to take and how much money you're willing to invest in mitigating those risks. All right, next up we have uh, Josh says, we're using indexed views to speed up performance. However, we're finding ourselves having to use the no expand query hint to see the performance actually increase. I feel dirty using it. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, Josh, that's a great question. So in theory, a SQL Server Enterprise Edition is supposed to automatically detect the presence of indexed views and use them appropriately whenever your query needs them. Even if your query didn't ask for that view, even if your query didn't use the no expand hint. In my experience, even when you're lucky enough that SQL Server Enterprise Edition actually picks up the view and uses the index, just because it does today, doesn't mean that it will tomorrow. And I've seen a lot of cases where I deployed an indexed view in order to make performance go better. And I was like, great, I'm out of here. And I walk away only to be called back to the client because SQL Server didn't always pick up the indexed view later. So if you're willing to put indexed views in and rely on them long term, I think that using the no expand hint is a smart idea anyway, because it just kind of future proofs your code. Just know that you're taking a dependency on the index has to exist and the view has to exist. 
So if there's still a possibility that you might remove those later, index views probably aren't a good fit. Uh, next up we have uh, uncompressed DBA. Uncompressed DBA says, hi Brent, I'm logging SP who is active results every minute. I see some page latch for page latch weights for one query. The query uses three tables. How can I identify which is the table or object experiencing the page latch weights? Okay, I, I think you're going about monitoring wrong because here's the thing. When you're logging SP who is active to, to table every minute, you are seeing a brief moment in time snapshot of what a query happen to be waiting for at one exact millisecond. You're probably not looking at top session weights in SP who is active. You're just looking at current weights. That is just like gambling. You're just rough guessing on performance tuning based on what one query happened to be waiting for at one millisecond of its execution. What I would do instead is A, look at your server's top weight types overall, and B, look for the queries causing those weight types. It feels like you're going the opposite way around. You're looking at queries just at random moments of time and then trying to figure out what they're waiting on. I'm not as big of a fan of that. Um, so I'll give you an example. Let's say that you have a query that runs for 10 seconds, and in those 10 seconds, it waits for CPU, parallelism, page latch waits, uh, asynchronous network I.O. If you captured it just at one random time of its execution and looked at that wait type, that wouldn't really mean anything. You wouldn't want to make decisions based off of that. Now, having said that, you asked, if I knew that a query was experiencing page latch weights, what would I look at? Man, I just don't know that I would look that way. If I did have to look that way, I'd say, okay, first, what are you, are you, is the query pulling too much data? Like, is it scanning large amounts of tables where it would be more appropriate to do an index seek instead of an entire table scan? Or is it possible, too, that this is doing an insert into something or an update into something? Uh, and how many pages is it having to scan that way? You, some, you could say, look at the table sizes, but that's not even reliable because depending on the execution plan, you might get a nested loop operation against the same table over and over again, having to read from it over and over again. So just the amount of gambling that you're doing there in that one, I'm just not a big fan. Look at it the other way around. Look at what your server's top weight types are first. And I bet page latch isn't your top weight type. It's not that I've never seen it. It's just extremely unusual. And in queries where page latch weights are the top weight type, I look at queries doing the most reads and start from there. Just reduce the number of reads that they're doing. All right, so there's a good uh, run through for a few queries. Now I'm going to go off and go uh, experiment or do take a look around at some of the icebergs and toys around here. So I will see y'all at the next office hours. Adios.